Part 2 continues when Kojo was struck by Sayaka out of jealousy. He released the power that he cannot control. This is even seen by Asagi as well. Kojo has no way to control himself and releases the insurmountable powers all around, causing a massive blast that sends waves so strong that the entire school is shaken. Asagi, being a normal human, is blasted off by the impact, but thankfully she isn't hurt that much. Yukina arrives at the scene to stop Sayaka and Kojo from causing further destruction and reprimands them for what they had done, despite it all being Sayaka's fault. Yukina takes Asagi to the school nurse, accompanied by Nagisa, Kojo's sister, where the nurse heals her using the magical ice pack that we all know about. After Asagi regains her consciousness, she confronts Yukina about her relationship with Kojo, but before they can talk further, Astarte, the homunculus who is now working under Natsuki appears, stopping their conversation midway. And soon enough, a few demons approach the building. There is always something happening non-stop here, isn't there? The demons quickly approach the room, and it looks like they were not after Kojo, they were after Asagi. When the demons surround the area, they quickly form a circle apprehending the girls from escaping. From the circle approaches the infamous Christoph Gardos, the terrorist that Ardeal had blackmailed Yukina and Kojo to assassinate. Gardos was here to kidnap Asagi, as she was the one who had the skills to decipher the Nalakuvera's weapon. Pretty sure there were tons of experts, but Gardos is an anime villain and knows that high schoolers have the power of plot armor. Gardos then shoots down Astarte before she can be of any issue and kidnaps the three girls. Motoki, a druid and friend of Kojo, who is also a secret follower of the fourth progenitor, he quickly rushes to save the girls, but just as he releases his main power to try and pursue the terrorists, Ardeal appears out of nowhere and stops him from doing anything. As expected, Ardeal was a sus man, who enjoys chaos and wants to add some spice to the anime. The three girls are then thrown into an isolated room where Gardos once again approaches them. Apparently, Asagi had solved a very difficult programming puzzle a few days ago which had piqued Gardos' organization's interest. Gardos reveals that he wanted to kill the first progenitor, and that was only possible if he knew how to use the Nalakuvera. He needed her, or actually wants her to solve the puzzle of how to use the weapon. Asagi is reluctant to do the task as she knows that the death of any one of the three progenitors would send the world to war and chaos. But it turns out that the puzzle that she solved earlier was already half of the solution to activate the weapon, and without the full solution, the weapon could malfunction and destroy the entire island. Turns out that Ardeal had also helped Gardos and his crew, but his motivation was only to get some entertainment out of it. Soon enough, Nalakuvera, which turns out to be a mechanized robot, appears in the street and starts causing havoc. Sayaka and Kojo get to the scene only for the smaller subfloat island to separate from the main one during their battle with the Nalakuvera. Kojo battles the Nalakuvera, and Sayaka joins the fight. However, the Nalakuvera appears to have the upper hand, especially because the Nalakuvera can actually learn from its opponent's attacks and can adapt to the moves. Having no other choice but to launch a full-on attack, Kojo decides to unleash his familiar. When his familiar drives the Nalakuvera into the ground, it causes an earthquake, and Sayaka and Kojo fall through a fissure to a lower level of the now leaking and unstable float. As Asagi works furiously at deciphering the control system for the Nalakuvera, Yukina goes around the base of the terrorist. The shaman stumbles upon a room filled with manufactured Nalakuveras. This was Gardos' ultimate plan, to create an army to wipe the progenitors from the earth. As expected, Gardos makes a villain's entrance and transforms into his demon form to battle with Yukina. The battle rages for a long time with Gardos and Yukina matching stride for stride. Finally, after some intense moves from both sides, Yukina severs his arm, but is prevented from defeating him by the sudden appearance of two more terrorists who bring with them unconscious Nagisa and Asagi as prisoners. Underground, Sayaka and Kojo are trapped, and take some time to figure out that it was almost impossible for them to get back, and they would probably drown. During their struggle, the two manage to settle their differences, and finally, Sayaka warms up to Kojo. This was a long time coming, by the way. We all knew Sayaka was a major tsundere. After settling their differences, Sayaka offers her blood to Kojo, and with the help of that, he manages to unlock another familiar under his control. With this new power, Kojo and Sayaka manage to get to the ground and re-enter the battle. Gardos takes the master Nalakuvera and leads the rest of the manufactured ones into the battle. 
At first, the gang of Nalakuveras at first seems to overpower the crew, and they seem impossible to defeat. After all, Nalakuvera was the weapon of the gods. However, Asagi had revealed that, after decoding the Nalakuvera she had added in, a slight code into the system which could be used to defeat the weapon. She had bugged the Nalakuvera system with a virus, probably Corona, and Yukina takes advantage of all of this. She jumps onto the weapon and throws in the audio file which would activate the virus. Soon enough, the Nalakuvera starts malfunctioning and falls down turning into dust. Now that there is a bit of normal again, Asagi lures Kojo into the school's art room to get closer to him without any other women nearby. She asks him if she can paint him, and when he hesitates to wear the costume she asked him to, she strips down alongside him to make him feel more secure. Yes, that's the perfect way to convince someone. After the whole picture and arts ordeal, Asagi cheekily asks Kojo out and manages to secure a date for the coming weekend. From afar, Yukina observes, with jealousy I guess. As Kojo discusses revealing his secret identity to Asagi, although they were just in a literal battle earlier, they witness Nagisa accepting a letter from a classmate. Turns out Kojo's sister was quite popular in the school, unlike him who was a social outcast. Later that night, Sayaka, who now seems to be friendlier with Kojo, calls him and informs him that she will be coming to the island this weekend as a VIP bodyguard. Pretty sure she wanted to meet him during the whole mission, but Kojo, gullible and ignorant as he is, concludes that she might be busy and won't be able to see him or Yukina. Wow, take a hint, dude. Kojo is pretty stressed at school that his sister is more popular and getting love letters left and right, so he stalks his sister at school along with Yukina and is introduced to a classmate of hers, the silver-haired Kanon Kanase. Despite her pretty awesome looks, the girl has a pretty sus habit. She collects feral cats in some nearby church ruins. Elsewhere, Natsuki and Motoki discuss the recovering victim from a recent aerial battle. Apparently, some weird white-haired demon had been going around attacking people and this was the fifth attack on ordinary humans. They believe that the demon was stealing something from the victims, but they were not quite sure. Once again, Adrenal approaches from the shadows. He does this quite a lot and informs them that the demon was actually stealing its victims' souls. The sus man promises to reveal more details, provided that Kojo was not involved in the case. Elsewhere, Kojo and Yukina accompany Natsuki and Astarte to a festival, which was actually a plan that Natsuki had created so that they could catch the recently appearing demons. Natsuki had planned to use the fireworks to create a distraction and fight the demons. They move to the tower where they anticipate another battle between the flying humanoids who they seek to capture. During the battle, they discover that their magic is ineffective against the flyers who seem to have the upper hand at all times. When one of the demons attacks Kojo, however, the other silver-haired flyer saves him and brutally assaults the first. She apparently has no chill and shows no mercy. While absolutely thrashing the other demon, her mask is destroyed, revealing that she is Cannon. Kojo and the others watch in horror as Cannon kills her and drinks her blood. The next day, in order to investigate the matter further, Kojo and Yukina visit Magnus Craft, the company run by Cannon's father. Conveniently so, the man is off-site, but his secretary Beatrice has the pair flown to a research island the company owns nearby. Pretty sure that she is leading them into a trap, but they go with her anyway, only for the pilot Lo to quickly strand them there. Told you it was a trap. Back in the city, wondering about Canon Kanase, Sayaka investigates the church ruins and encounters Motoki, who she recalls seeing with the sus guy Adriel. They get into a bit of a banter and are soon joined moments later by Nagisa and Asagi. Asagi and Sayaka have some old matters to clear, back when Sayaka attacked Kojo. After finishing with their drama, all of them head to a nearby internet cafe where Asagi uses her skills to track down the whereabouts of Kojo and Yukina. At the island, Kojo and Yukina have made a Bear grill styled settlement and have prepared well for spending the night at the island as there is little hope that they will be rescued soon. When the night finally arrives, Yukina is nowhere to be seen, however, so Kojo heads out to look for her. I'd ask why he isn't scared, but then he is a literal immortal vampire, so why would he be? As Kojo enters deep into the forest, he soon comes across a moonlit pool, and in that pool, he notices a silver-haired beauty. We can't show her though because she is completely naked, but trust me when I say she looks just like Canon. Kojo blinks his eyes once to see if it was a dream and just like that, the woman disappears. Instead, a spear falls on his back. It was Yukina who was also bathing there and knows that Kojo is a pervert. 
He hands her his jacket, although if she came here on her own, wouldn't she have her clothes with her? As the two look around for the cannon clone that Kojo saw earlier, a hovercraft approaches the island and beaches. A squad of robot soldiers disembarks and immediately attacks Kojo and Yukina. The craft was sent by Magus Craft. Cannon's father seems to be involved with all this. The two manage to fight off some of the robots, but are soon surrounded. Fear not, because due to what we call plot armor, our heroes are saved when they are rescued by La Folia Rehavian, the woman Kojo had seen bathing. After La Folia finishes most of the robots, Kojo destroys the remaining soldiers and their landing craft. La Folia reveals that Magnus Craft was after the royal blood in her for some reason and had probably come here to get her. Turns out that her blood was needed so that Kenzi Kanase, Cannon's father, can perform his spells, which is why he wanted her captured. Soon enough, another hovercraft beaches, waving a flag of truce, and Cannon's adoptive father, Kensei Kanase, greets them, accompanied by Beatrice and Lo. The trio reveals their plans that they were developing Cannon into what Kensei terms an angel, a supreme monster with incredible power against her will. In order to become the angel, she had to consume the other humanoid monsters, which is why earlier they were fighting like crazy in the sky. They demand the blood from La Folia so that they can make further advancements to Cannon, whom they carry around like a gun in their briefcase. The group also plans to use Cannon to kill Kojo so that they could later sell her as the weapon that can even kill the world's most powerful vampire. Soon a fight breaks out between the group and, when Kojo and his crew gain the upper hand, the villains release Cannon. She immediately releases a powerful beam that appears to have killed Kojo with a single strike. The sight of Kojo's death disrupts Cannon's mental state unpredictably, and she creates a tower of ice around herself. Elsewhere, not far from the island, Sayaka assaults and takes control of a Magus craft after slaughtering all the robot soldiers guarding the ship, and is joined on it by Natsuki, who had been searching for La Folia. The two decide to head to the island to rescue their friends. Curled up into a ball, Cannon agonizes about what she had done while encased in ice at the top of her self-imposed barrier. Using the same tower of ice, Yukina has created a magical shelter for herself, La Folia, and a lifeless Kojo. In order to bring Kojo back to life, La Folio comes up with a plan and strips all the way down, despite the cold, mind you. She believes that arousing Kojo could invoke his vampiric urges and bring him back. Yukina, who can't seem to let any other girl near the fourth progenitor, strips down herself and kisses Kojo until suddenly the vampire comes back to life and starts sucking her… blood. Soon with the blood's help, a familiar inside of Kojo heals the wounds he had incurred in the last battle and returns Kojo to consciousness. Inspired by this display, and perhaps wanting to add more complications to Kojo's life, La Folio gives herself to Kojo and lets him feed on her as well. This finally gains Kojo control over a third familiar. I'm not really sure how this works until now, but Kojo has a new power now. With this power, he confronts the patiently waiting Kensei. At first, Kojo and his group try to use Naruto's Tak no Jutsu to make a deal with Kenzi and turn him to the good side, but it's no use and soon once more, a battle breaks out. Turns out that Beatrice had cloned the angels without Kenzi's approval and unleashes them on the progenitor and his group, only to be absolutely thrashed. Then, with the new familiar that Kojo just unlocked, he manages to separate Kanon from the spiritual energy of the angel and saves her from becoming a mindless demon. Thanks for watching part 2, 2000 likes and I'll know you guys want part 3. See you on the next one!